Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Maria Altman. We're pleased to welcome Washington University Chancellor Mark Wrighton. Wrighton has led the university for nearly 25 years and is set to retire June 1st. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Well, one of the things that I have learned in doing a little bit of reading is that the typical tenure for a chancellor is about six and a half to seven years. And you've been with Washington University for for about 24. I'm wondering what has kept you here and enabled you also to stay for so long? Washington University is a great institution and I've been so well rewarded in having opportunities to work with talented people. We have a great team, and we've done a lot of things together. Uh, Working together uh, on the important challenges that any university will face is a part of what uh, makes for a great institution. And having the opportunity to work with talented people with great aspirations, realizing we're not going to be able to realize everything has been stimulating, and I feel fortunate to have been able to serve so long. St. Louis is a great community, and I've enjoyed living here. Well, one of the things we talked about uh, this a little bit before we went on air, but um, your background is as a chemistry professor, and you hold a number of patents, and you you worked at MIT for a number of years before becoming the provost at MIT, and I'm wondering what makes you think as a chemistry professor, yeah, I'd like to go into administration. Many people who work in the world of chemistry, especially those who have experimental groups, uh, are experienced in working with people, with finances, uh, raising money. Uh, these are parts of what would be a, you know, a job description in connection with administration. So having had a very large and very successful research group, I felt that administration would be potentially interesting. I wasn't sure at the outset because in chemistry, it's possible to do something that no one else has ever done and you can prove it uh, (laughs) and and do so within your own laboratory. Uh, When you're involved in administration, you can undertake an initiative, but you might not know the result for even decades to come. Right. Well, and when you came here in 1995, you were stepping into some very big shoes. Um, Chancellor Bill Danforth, who had been the chancellor longest serving, still will remain the longest serving chancellor of Washington University. Was that intimidating for you? And and how did you approach that? I enjoyed working with Bill from the very beginning. Together, we will have served 48 years. He 24, I 24. And uh, from the very beginning, uh, Bill emerged as a great mentor. I came into St. Louis not knowing anyone, at least no one other than the 24 members of the search committee. But I came to realize that Bill Danforth knew everyone. Hmm. And he was very generous in spending time with me, introducing me to the community. And it's very important to have someone who has the experience of having been chancellor to call on, to raise certain questions. Bill had been at the university even before serving as chancellor, so he was a tremendous resource, and I still interact with him. In fact, we were together just last night at an event. Wow. Looking back, what were the things that when you came into WashU, you thought, I really want to preserve this? and of a few of the things that you thought, I'd like to see that change. Newcomers often uh, experience everything for the first time, of course. And one of the things that I learned quite quickly is that there's a very strong sense of community at Washington University. When I first arrived, I thought the engaging uh, community was really just being nice because I'm the incoming chancellor. But I learned subsequently that we are very supportive of the entire community and especially newcomers. And I've felt that that is one of the great legacies of Bill Danforth. 
and I wanted to work hard to preserve that. Uh, Bill did a fabulous job in building a strong sense of community, and the late Jim McLeod that uh, was a part of the search committee that led to my appointment uh, taught me a lot also, and uh, he was a tremendous leader for us and encouraged uh, the student potty and their parents to become a part of the family as well. Challenges uh, exist at every institution, and um, there were surprises to me, even though I had a very significant academic experience at MIT. Every academic institution is going to be a little different. Uh, some of the things that I encountered uh, administratively were things I wanted to change. And one thing that I did uh, at the very beginning was to convene a group of leaders, not just the academic leaders, but all of the leaders at the university, so that when we met, uh, we call it the university council. When every member is present, every person at the university is represented by their maximum leader. And I felt that those in the more purely administrative functions would benefit from directly interacting with those responsible for academic programs. And you have a lot of employees, I, some 15,000, is that right? Yes, indeed. We're one of the largest employers in the region. Uh, in that regard, we have a lot of impact, and uh, we have 15,000 employees and only 14,000 students. When the parents of undergraduates hear that, they say, well, now I know why you're so expensive. <laughs> But of course, we have a tremendous uh, school of medicine, and its mission includes patient care programs. I'm really proud uh, of Washington University's School of Medicine as one of the leading providers of outstanding health care in our region. Absolutely. Well, in, in looking at the statistics and some of the numbers regarding Washington University in the 24 years, it's pretty impressive. The, the number of students went from about 11,500 in 1995 to more than 15,000 today. The number of faculty, as you talked about, has gone up from about 2,000 24 years ago to more than 3,000 today. You were involved with uh, helping raise a, a very significant amount of money, about $5 billion over that time, and a lot of new buildings on the campus, 50 new buildings between the medical campus and, and the Danforth campus. But I'm wondering for you what you see as the most important accomplishments in, in your time as chancellor. I would say at the top of the list in terms of progress we've made is to be able to attract a diverse and extremely high quality student body. Today, our undergraduate students are competitive with the very best academic institutions anywhere, including those that have extremely high name recognition, and they have been at a very high level academically for a long time. So I'm really proud that uh, we've been able to recruit a group of students that are the best in America. And I, I extend gratitude to first John Berg, who was the master of our admissions program, and the entire team that he recruited to work with him. Um, we regarded recruiting as a university-wide endeavor. And today, Ronai Turner continues that effort, and I think we're doing even better in terms of recruiting really outstanding students. So that would have to be one of the top uh, programmatic uh, achievements. But it's not me, it's these other individuals who are doing the work. Um, on, on the medical school campus, and I think most important for this community has been the development of the Alvin J. Seitman Cancer Center. I often joke that I'm a doctor, but you know I'm not the kind that can help you. But uh, I was very supportive of first Dean William Peck in terms of making plans to develop a cancer center. We recruited Dr. Timothy Eberline, the then head of surgery, to also be the director of what became the Seitman Cancer Center. And that it, was back in the in the late '90s. Late '90s, yes. And uh, today, uh, Tim Eberline has developed the 
most important cancer center for a very large area. We're the third largest cancer center in the United States. And from the National Cancer Institute, we have been designated a comprehensive cancer center that includes efforts in research, prevention, education, and of course, uh, patient care. This is a great achievement. I often say, you know, resources are important, financial resources, but also you need the leadership. And uh, Alvin Seitman, among many, uh, has made tremendous gifts to support the development of the Seitman Cancer Center. Many people have uh, enhanced our financial base. But Tim Eberlein, and first Dean William Peck, and then Dean Larry Shapiro, and now uh, Dean David Perlmutter are fueling the advance of what is one of the most important resources for this entire region. Well, we're going to be taking a break in just a moment, but I want to give our listeners a chance to call us at 314-382-8255. That's 314-382-TALK. You can send us an email at talk at stlpublicradio.org or send us a tweet at STL on air. I'm speaking with Washington University Chancellor Mark Wrighton about his long tenure leading the university. We'll be back in just a moment. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com. Welcome back. And Chancellor Wrighton, um, we're going to take a couple of calls, but first we're, we're going to hear from Sean, who's from St. Louis, asking about some expansion plans for the university. Sean, are you there? Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Chancellor Wrighton, I just wanted to say, first of all, I uh, got my Ph.D. in chemistry from Washington University under Bill Burrow in 2000, and I'm just astounded at all of the uh, changes I see on campus all the time. I still live in the St. Louis area, and every time I drive by WashU, I'm just amazed at the uh, the amount of buildings and the, the construction and the expansion. And I want to say that you have done an excellent job as chancellor, and it's just very impressive. So Thanks very much. And, and, and good luck in your future. I do have a question. It's really kind of a silly question. I, I actually live in South St. Louis City, and uh, – I don't know what future expansion plans for WashU might hold, but uh, I don't know if you're aware of the building that's that's off of uh, off of Grand Avenue that used to be the um, used to be the uh, the Rossi uh, College uh, the uh, oh what's that called the the uh, I'm going blank on it. Now. The Armory, perhaps? No, no, the Cleveland Academy. I knew it would come to me. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a great building, and it's in an area that probably sorely needs some investment. And it, it resembles several of the, the buildings on the WashU campus. And uh, I just always kind of daydream that maybe someday WashU would go down, realize that it's uh, architecturally similar, and, and redevelop the building somehow. But uh, it's, it's just more of a suggestion and, uh, you know, nothing, nothing else other than to say thank you, uh, Chancellor Wrighton, for, for your service. And uh, I certainly appreciate it as an alumni. Well, always great to hear from a fellow chemist, especially an alumnus of Washington University. I hope uh, your career in chemistry is unfolding well. Um, When we think about expansion of our campus, we first look to opportunities that would be contiguous with our current campus. We are in the midst of what is promising to be perhaps the largest development project in our modern era, and this is the east end of the Danforth campus. We have a number of buildings that are being developed, including uh, buildings for the Sam Fox School of Design and Visual Arts. This is Weill Hall, Jubal Hall for the School of Engineering and Applied Science, and McKelvey Hall for the McKelvey School of Engineering. Um, This uh, great development will expand our academic resources, and for the moment, I do not believe we will be acquiring property that would be distant from the campus, but I'll be happy to take a look at that building and 
consider a development prospect in the future. And those, those um, changes on the East Campus, that's really going to be complete this fall. Is that is that right? Most of the changes? Most of the changes that are currently underway uh, will be complete, um, materially complete, by May 10th. Today oh, is wow. April 2nd. Uh, what Ahead use, of schedule? What use, no, we, this has been our schedule for since we started the project. We had one commencement where we had a very challenging environment. Uh, we have an underground parking garage as a part of the project. And parking and is always an, is an, an issue, I can say, as a reporter who's had to visit Washington University And those times. 800 uh, parking places will be available for this coming commencement, which will be May 17th. Uh, the buildings will be materially complete, including the Summers Welcome Center and the Schnook Pavilion, which will be for dining and environmental studies and our sustainability programs. These facilities, uh, in addition to an expansion of the Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum, will be materially complete and move-in will take place over the summer and then in the fall, in the early fall, in uh, the first week of October, uh, these resources will be dedicated. Wow, that's great. And and you've you've had, I mean, you have immense resources, of course, at, at Washington University, and to be able to to um, really not only have great buildings but also endow a number of faculty positions. And but one of the things we've certainly heard in more recent years that you've grappled with as a university is sort of dealing with socioeconomic disparities and and really attracting students who may be not just diversity in terms of of where they're from but also lower income you know students from who come from lower income families and i'm i'm wondering um Ha- have things moved forward with that? I know there was an article in the New York Times that got a lot of attention back in 2017 mm-hmm. talking about the, the the high percentage of students that come from from the one, 1% earners as opposed to a, a much smaller percentage of students who come from uh, the sort of the bottom end. Has that changed? Yes, the makeup of our student body has changed significantly. I would credit a number of people for helping us strengthen socioeconomic diversity. We've had a goal for the last several years to build up to 13% of all of our undergraduates being eligible for Pell Grants. Pell Grant eligibility is a surrogate for a measure of socioeconomic diversity, and we're ahead of that schedule. So I'm very proud of that achievement. A number of individuals have been very helpful. I would credit our provost, Holden Thorpe, for not only uh, driving us to achieve that goal, but also helping us become engaged in our own community. For example, we've launched the Washington University College Prep Program. This is for students in high school who would be the first in their generation, the first in their family, uh, to go to college. And we have a program that includes a residential component right with our undergraduates on our residential halls, and they can take academic credit at Washington University. The program involves about 50 students uh, from each class, starting with uh, first-year students in high school, So at Steady State, we're dealing with 150 students in our region. These and other programs uh, are lifting attention to Washington University as a place that will admit talented people and they will be able to afford to matriculate. Uh, The financial aid resources uh, have been a challenge for us and in the last fundraising campaign, which we called Leading Together, we added uh, nearly $600 million to our financial aid resources. A Pell Grant eligible student will bring that Pell Grant to support the education, but that's only about $5,500. Our sticker price is much greater. Sure. So every Pell Grant eligible student receives full support from the university for tuition, room, and board, and we're very proud that we are able now to do that, uh, thanks to many generous donors. When we talk about physical infrastructure, it's easy to see a building, but it's hard to see immediately the impact of 
financial aid, but we're transforming lives by supporting these outstanding students. Oh, and one thing I wanted to, to ask about, too, um, once you, you get a first-generation college student in, I know we've done some reporting. Our own Nancy Fowler did a really powerful story about a student who's a freshman at Washington University and has a full, um, full scholarship, which is in- incredible, um, but has struggled with some other issues. I believe she has some dental issues and, and you know, has copes with a family that is sending money back to Senegal. And, and so she has issues and struggles that are beyond what many of her peers probably have ever even thought about dealing with. How is the university going to help um, a student like that cope with some of those challenges? The university has uh, realized for some time that the needs of our students are quite significant beyond tuition, room, and board. And many people who come from challenged financial backgrounds are not able to take full advantage of programs like study abroad. That's an extra expense. So Washington University has decided we should step forward and make sure that our programs are going to be available to all of our students. Uh, This is a commitment that I know will be um, made as well by my successor, uh, Dr. Andrew Martin. And uh, they've already taken some new steps to support uh, students in terms of financial needs that go beyond tuition, room, and board. One other thing to point out in connection with our support for students is that for students who come from families with less than $75,000 of family income on an annual basis, they can receive full support and will leave Washington University with no loans. Very often, colleges and universities extend financial aid to socioeconomically diverse students, but encumber those students and families with major loans. So we're in a mode where we're providing that support for education and their expenses here, while also assuring that their level of debt is de minimis. Something that we're hearing so much about, student loan debt, crippling many people. Um, In sort of widening the lens a bit to the St. Louis community, which certainly has had its ups and downs over recent years, and I'm thinking in particular, we're coming up on the five-year anniversary of Ferguson this August. What is Washington University doing, and I know you, the the university is doing things, um, to reach out to the wider community? One of the initiatives that I'm very proud of uh, that has taken place uh, during my time is the development of the Richard A. Gephardt Institute for Civic and Community Engagement. We bring the outstanding students from all around the country and from around the world, and I'm proud that uh, a very large fraction of them care about this community and make commitments to assist in strengthening St. Louis. under the leadership of Stephanie Kurtzman, we have uh, great programs that bring our undergraduates into settings in our community that are challenging, uh, and our students really are very helpful. They're not just building their resume, they're making important contributions. Under the leadership of Vicki May, uh, we have the Institute for School Partnership. Uh, this is a program that engages uh, Washington University with public schools all across the region. And this is another contribution. We're regarded as a a strong educational institution, and it's great to see that we have key leaders drawing in our students and others uh, to assist in assuring strong educational opportunities in the region. We're also um, very proud that we're engaged in programs that hopefully will overcome the health disparities in our region. Uh, Professor Jason Purnell of the Brown School of Social Work, uh, working collaboratively with other faculty at Washington University and St. Louis University, did an excellent job in documenting challenges that we face in the community. Another initiative that I believe is significant in taking steps to address these challenges is the development of our Institute for Public Health. 
This is now led by uh, Dr. William Powderly, and this is a program that uh, is already making important progress. We're educating uh, leaders in public health, and with just 10 years behind us in terms of getting this underway, we're a top 20 program in terms of the Masters of Public Health degree program, and uh, we're working alongside other organizations in the community to work to overcome the significant health disparities in this region. So a lot of civic engagement, obviously. And and, and building on that a, a bit, um, changing gears a little, you you are involved in the Better Together initiative as the, the campaign chairman, I believe. Correct. Um, and I, this is this is the effort to merge uh, St. Louis City and St. Louis County. And I'm wondering for you, why do you think it's a good idea to do that? During my tenure as, as chancellor at Washington University, we have done extremely well in terms of attracting interest uh, in Washington University. Our applicant pool is robust and much larger than when I first started uh, about 24 years ago. But as we have followed the progress of other regions, including regions that have premier research universities, uh, we see that St. Louis is lagging behind. Uh, We are making progress, to be sure. In fact, uh, I'm really pleased with what we and others have been doing in connection with the development of the Cortex Innovation Community at... uh, the grounds of the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center. We have 39 North as another locus of entrepreneurial activity. And downtown, we have a lot of IT infrastructure being developed with T-Rex. But though our progress is noticeable and significant, other communities are doing much, much better. I had occasion to be in Denver for about 10 days in February, and that community is a buzz. Young people want to be there. It's an exciting, growing region. Uh, Nashville is another uh, city with tremendous momentum, and Nashville, of course, is home to Vanderbilt. And because Nashville is thriving, Vanderbilt is doing better. Indianapolis, Louisville. So I believe that we must do something to overcome the stagnation in our community. I'm not a person who believes that growth is everything. We've had growth at Washington University, but uh, compared to aspiring businesses, our growth has been quite modest. Well, let me ask you, because we we have you know, obviously heard some people within the city and the county suggest that taking this to a statewide vote, as as is the plan in 2020, would disenfranchise voters in the city and in in the county. I'm sure you've had these kinds of conversations. What, What do you say to that? The challenge we face is so significant that I believe the constitutional amendment is necessary that requires a statewide vote. And it's not just that we're bringing the city and the county together, but we're proposing with the Better Together plan one municipal court system. I think this is an assurance that we will have equal justice throughout our community. We're proposing that there be one police force, uh, a stronger, better resourced, uniformly well-trained police force that will serve the entire community. By coming together, uh, we will, in fact, be a larger city, will be the ninth largest city in America. And yes, uh, crime statistics will be more favorable, but just by coming together is not going to eliminate crime. Our challenges are greater than many imagine. We face uh, situations in our community where poverty is a a huge challenge, and it brings about many of the evident problems that we need to address. The Better Together plan uh, will be a framework for 
a government that will be responsive to the will of the people and a government that will uh, introduce new policies responsive to addressing the challenges that we face. And looking ahead, um, what do you see as the opportunities and also the challenges for the university as uh, doc- Dr. Andrew Martin takes over on, on June 1st? Washington University is um, in a very good place, but doubtless there will be new and important challenges to address. And I had the privilege of listening to Dr. Martin uh, as he had his last interview with the Board of Trustees. And I have to say, I'm so glad that I did not have to answer the questions (laughs) the board posed to him. He did a fabulous job. And I know that he cares deeply about strengthening diversity and inclusion, has already taken steps to do a better job in that respect. Uh, We also face a number of issues in connection with sustaining our momentum. And among these is an issue that we, we talked about already, namely, how do we support talented students independent of their family's income? So we're going to have to redouble our efforts to strengthen uh, the support for outstanding students and make sure that every admitted student can matriculate and leave debt-free. Um, you're going to be returning to the classroom in the fall, I understand, as a, as a chemistry professor? I'm returning uh, to what I regard as the best and most important job at a university. I'm stepping up. I'm not stepping down. (laughs) I'm stepping up to be a professor. Uh, I will uh, plan to teach. The first uh, class I'm planning to teach is going to be on financing higher education, something that I've learned a lot about as provost at MIT and now chancellor at Washington University. Um, This will be a graduate-level course. We're developing a program to prepare uh, graduate students to be involved in higher education management. This is this this sounds new to me. This doesn't sound like a, a course that I had heard about when I was in school. Is is that sort of a new area? It would be a new course, certainly for Washington University, and uh, I believe that, in fact, uh, we involved in administration have failed our students in not providing opportunities for them to learn. Where do their uh, tuition dollars go? Why is it expensive to undertake the programs that we do? And how do we overall finance the experience that our students have? How do we support research? Many people do not appreciate, for example, that when we receive a federal grant or contract, that it doesn't quite cover the expenses of the project. Where, how do we meet that gap? And that comes from philanthropy. And philanthropy is a big part of our success story. How do we encourage people to support us? What is the return to society from the philanthropic support? And uh, how are we going to be able to continue to manage at a time when there are significant federal constraints in terms of the budget for important programs like the National Cancer Institute. That sounds like an interesting class. Um, I do have to ask, what will you miss about not being chancellor? One of the things that I I realized uh, when I took my first administrative job at MIT, I became chair of the chemistry department. And I discovered that one of the things that is a real joy is the opportunity to help people realize their potential. Uh, I did that, I think, in some measure as a department chair and as a provost and as a chancellor. Uh, I had uh, authority and I had resources. And in many cases, I was able to be able to respond affirmatively to people with a good idea something that would be new and significant. And uh, 
I think I'm going to miss that the most. Well, I understand you're a very uh, avid sports fan of Washington University sports, so I would assume you're, you're going to be watching those teams closely, even yes. as you, you're no longer chancellor. Yes, even though people uh, note that we built a lot of buildings and we've uh, created more than 300 new endowed professorships, not everyone realizes what a sports powerhouse we are uh, in terms of NCAA intercollegiate uh, sports. Uh, we have, I think, 23 championships Wow! during my tenure. 18 of those have been won. Go Bears! So <laughs> we call our athletes scholar champions, and I'm looking forward to following them. Well, Chancellor Mark Wrighton, thank you so much for joining us today, and best of luck. Thank you very much. Great to be in St. Louis. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com.